Welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Wednesday, January 3rd, 2024. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, For me, it is maybe not the most happiest New Year because as you can probably tell as regular listeners will immediately notice, my voice is not what it always is. So I apologize for that. There will be minimal talking from me today, which I'm sure many listeners will be happy about. And instead, we will hear from our lovely guests, both of whom are colleagues of mine at the Institute for Justice. So I'd like to introduce... Betsy Sands, who's coming back on the show, and also John Rentinch. Welcome back, both of you. Thanks, Anthony. So nice to be here. Thanks, Anthony. It's nice to be back. Thank you, guys, and Happy New Year to you. Um, So I will uh, not waste any more time or my voice. And we're going to start with John, who has a case from the First Circuit. Later, we'll have Betsy with a case from the Ninth Circuit. And John... um, I'm very impressed that he took this case, um, partly because it's a very interesting Fourth Amendment case, and also because the First Circuit insists on continuing to use courier font. And for those of you who usually read cases, or non-lawyers, of course, will not get any of this, and that's fine. But us lawyers who are always reading cases, um, some people usually read it in Westlaw or Lexis, and then it doesn't matter. But if you go to the source, the, the... the court's website, the day it comes out, and you read it that way, and it's First Circuit case, you have to deal with this darn font that we have complained about too many times probably on the show, but I'm going to complain about it again. And if there are any clerks, any administrators, or even judges on the First Circuit, I beg you one more time, maybe consider following the lead of your colleagues in other circuits and moving to a new font. Anyway, take it away, John. I just, I, 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 I'll just note that Anthony promised he wouldn't be talking too much because of his sore throat, but that was an important point he needed to make. So. I, it, it just had to be done, and now I won't <laughs> talk for the rest of the show. <laughs> I mean, if we don't get through anything else in this, I think that the the cry for help to get away from Courier might have been worth it. It is. Um, unpleasant to read. And actually, when I was reading through this decision, um, I, I waited for Westlaw because reading through the actual um, the actual court issued opinion is is pretty tough. But um, even the First Circuit can't stop us from reading their decisions. Um, so uh, like Anthony said, this involves uh, an interesting Fourth Amendment issue. Um, and we'll get into this exception a little bit more. But um, as as people who listen to this uh, podcast regularly may be aware of, normally when you search uh, something protected by the Fourth Amendment, you need to have a warrant based on probable cause. But there are a legion of exceptions um, to that rule, and one of them is the so-called search incident to arrest exception. So I'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's going to be the issue that's involved in this case. Um, and so On the evening of August 30th, 2019, a Massachusetts state trooper named Conant, he's patrolling and he sees a pickup truck with a main license plate and uh, the the truck stops in a McDonald's parking lot. So the officer observes the driver of the truck, who's named uh, Gilbert Perez, exit the vehicle. Perez puts on a backpack and he starts walking toward a residential area. The officer finds this suspicious. Um, Just as a note, it's not clear from the opinion what exactly about um, this was suspicious. Was it parking in McDonald's? Was it having a main license plate? It's unclear. But for whatever reason, the officer found this suspicious. And so he alerts some nearby state troopers to be um, on the lookout for Perez, kind of watch watch to see what he's doing. And a couple of minutes later, one of those officers, Officer McIntyre, who's also patrolling nearby, he sees Perez exit a taxi. Perez begins to walk back towards his truck from the taxi, that his truck is still parked in the McDonald's parking lot. And Officer McIntyre stops a taxi after Perez has exited. And he looks down into the uh, where the passenger is sitting and he sees 
just a pile of cash sitting at the passenger's feet. So Officer McIntyre radios Conan, the, the officer who first observed Perez, informing him of the cash and his suspicion that Perez might have just um, participated in a drug transaction. So Officer Conan pulls into the McDonald's parking lot. He exits his vehicle. He yells state police and Perez makes a run for it. Officer Conan eventually um, catches him after a, a short foot chase. And um, then another, a third officer, Officer Dolan, arrives at the scene. Perez is then handcuffed while he's pinned on the ground. One of the officers removes the backpack that he's wearing and places it on the squad car. That officer then opens the backpack and begins to search it. And just as a note, because this um, could be relevant later, the backpack was not within Perez's reach when the officer opened and searched it. Again, Perez is pinned on the ground, already handcuffed. When the officer searches Perez's backpack, they find fentanyl and cocaine, and he's ultimately charged with drug-related offenses. Perez moves to suppress the drugs, and he argues that the officer's search of his backpack violated the Fourth Amendment. So the issue in this case, the main issue, is under the search incident to arrest exception, were the officers authorized to open and search Prez's backpack without first obtaining a warrant? And so under that exception, the search incident to arrest exception, the lawful arrest of an individual triggers officers' authority to conduct a warrantless search for two purposes. These are the justifications behind the search incident to arrest exception. The first justification is to protect officer safety. And the second one is to preserve evidence that an arrestee might conceal or destroy. So officer safety and preserving evidence. So an easy example of that, let's start with that, is when officers arrest someone and they immediately search their person and they find drugs in their pocket. That's kind of a stereotypical example of the search incident to arrest exception. And in that scenario, um, under the Fourth Amendment, the officers would not have needed to obtain a warrant uh, to search the arrestee um, and find drugs in their pocket or a gun in their waistband or something like that. The issue here is what happens when officers are not searching the arrestee's pockets or waistband, but instead an item that they're carrying or holding like a briefcase or a backpack. And there's three Supreme Court decisions, all from the 70s, that are going to kind of help the court answer this question. And uh, the first one is called uh, United States versus Robinson. This was desi decided in 1973. And that's a case where an officer um, finds a cigarette package um, while searching the arrestee's person. And the court said that the officer could open that crumpled cigarette package without a warrant because they were um, they conducted an, a lawful arrest and were doing a valid search incident to that arrest. The second case that's going to matter, which was um, also decided in 1973, is Gustafson v. Florida. In that case, the arrestee had a cigarette box in their the front pocket of their coat, and the officer had removed that cigarette box and searched it after the arrestee was placed in the squad car. There too, the Supreme Court said that that is a valid search incident to arrest. And then the third case um, is decided the year later in 1974, that's United States versus Edwards. In that case, the United States Supreme Court said that officers could search an arrestee's clothing the day after the individual's arrest. So that involved a situation where Edwards was in a cell and it wasn't until the next morning that the officers uh, wanted to search Edward's clothing that he had been wearing um, as potential evidence. So the takeaway, or at least one takeaway from those cases, is that the exception allows officers to open or search some items found on the arrestee's person, even when the arrestee is already subdued or when time has, pa has passed since the arrest. So it's interesting to keep in mind the original justifications for the exception with that takeaway. Again, it was to protect officers' safety and to uh, preserve evidence. 
So the, the issue that this case presents is what happens when the item that officers want to search, it's not their clothes, it's not in their pockets, it's not in their waistband. What if it's an item that they're carrying? But back in 1975, the First Circuit actually already addressed this question in a case called the United States versus Etherton. And in that case, a suspected bank robber was walking down the street and he was carrying a briefcase when he was stopped by police who told him to drop the briefcase. Officers then frisked Etherton, they handcuffed him, and then they searched the briefcase, which contained a loaded gun and ski masks. So in that, in that case, the First Circuit held that the warrantless search of Etherton's briefcase fell within the search incident to arrest exception based on the cases that we just discussed, Robinson, Gustafson, and Edwards. Back to Perez's backpack here. Everyone involved, Perez, the majority, and the dissent, because there's, there's going to be a dissenting opinion, agree that Perez loses this case if Etherton is still good law. But Perez says that Etherton is no longer good law based on two more recent Supreme Court decisions. The first is United States versus Chadwick. That's a 1977 decision where the court held that uh, the warrantless search of an arrestee's locked 200-pound footlocker, which they obviously weren't carrying, was unconstitutional because the locker was beyond um, the area from which the arrestee might gain possession of a weapon um, or destructible evidence. In other words, Chadwick is referring back to that original justification for the exception. Is the arrestee in reach of something that could hurt the officers, or are they in reach of evidence that could be destroyed? But the First Circuit looks at Chadwick, one of these intervening decisions, and says, well, it wasn't about the search of an item that was on the arrestee's person. It wasn't being held. It was a 200-pound footlocker. And the court also notes that Chadwick um, appears to bless warrantless searches of personal property that's immediately associated with the arrestee. Um, so the court just doesn't think that Chadwick called its early decision in Etherton um, into question. The second more recent decision is Arizona v. Gantt. That was in 2009, where the Supreme Court held that officers cannot just court categorically search all personal property located in an arrestee's vehicle when there is neither the risk that the arrestee can access the vehicle, again, think officer safety and destruction of evidence, nor is there a likelihood of evidence relevant to the crime in the vehicle. And in that case, the driver was arrested for driving without a suspended license, so there was no evidence in the vehicle um, that would be related to that offense. But here, too, the First Circuit does not believe that Gantt called Etherton into question because it did not address the issue of personal property that someone was carrying in their hands. The, the majority does acknowledge that at least two other circuits have come out the other way on this. The 10th Circuit in a 2019 decision and the 3rd Circuit in a 2010 decision. But some circuits um, have come out the other way. The 4th Circuit um, in 1997, the seventh circuit in 1981 and the eighth circuit in 1998. I, I do think that it's interesting that the um, the decisions that are in conflict with the majority's view are all um, decisions from the past decade. Some one as recent as as four years ago, five years ago, and all of the decisions that the majority is relying on um, that came out the other way are from 1977, 81, and 98. So. Um, the decisions that disagree with them are actually a little bit more recent. And then one final comment um, on the majority opinion here, because the majority looks at Riley versus California, it doesn't believe that it's one of the decisions that it really needs to look at, but it's, it, it says that it wants to um, kind of discuss it, because I think that there's an argument that can be made that... Um, this case does actually pose a problem for the majority's view, but it's Riley versus California. And in that case, the Supreme Court held that the search incident to arrest exception doesn't authorize officers to search an arrestee's cell phone without a warrant, even though the cell phone was found on the arrestee's that, That's person. the case, right, where the chief justice just says, if you want to get in a cell phone, 
get a warrant. Full stop. Right. 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 Riley Riley certainly stands for the idea that cell phones are different. And since Riley, courts have been dealing with um, what really is the scope of Riley? Does it apply to things outside of cell phones? Does it apply to things that are just information dense? Um, or is it really a holding unique to cell phones? But the First Circuit is looking at Riley. Um, and even though Riley says, uh, referring back to Chadwick, the case with the 200 pound trunk, the court in Riley actually says, well, it's not clear that search incident to arrest would apply if someone was lugging the 200 pound chest behind them, if they were dragging it behind them. And even though the, the Supreme Court in Riley says that, here the First Circuit um, just doesn't think that that suggestion is relevant. And the, the First Circuit's reasoning, at least the majority's reasoning here, is that it's just hard to see the distinction between a container that's in someone's pocket, which would be a valid search, think of the, the crumpled cigarette package, or a container that's held in someone's hand. So the majority concludes that there is not um, clear and convincing evidence that its earlier decision in Etherton is no longer good law. It says that it's bound by Etherton, and it upholds the warrantless search of Perez's backpack. The majority does note that the en banc process, quote, supplies the proper means for our court to reconsider Etherton in light of all that has transpired in its wake. Um, so I'll just, uh, I also wanted to comment on the dissenting opinion because while the majority references the en banc process, the dissent does not believe that the panel needs to wait um, for a rehearing en banc um, to decide that Etherton uh, was wrongly decided in light of inter intervening decisions. So um, Judge Laura Montecalvo dissents on the ground that the First Circuit's earlier decision in Etherton is no longer law of the circuit. And it's important to kind of start from where the majority and the dissent are thinking of their obligations to circuit precedent. The dissent starts from a fundamentally different view of the panel's authority to disregard circuit precedent. Both the majority and the dissent agree that a panel can disregard circuit precedent if, and this is the standard, if authority that postdates the original decision although not directly controlling, offers a sound reason for believing that the former, for, former panel, in light of fresh developments, would change its collective minds. So in other words, is there a sound reason to think that the earlier panel would have reached a different conclusion if they had the benefit of more recent decisions? And the majority says that cases triggering that standard are hen's teeth rare, while the dissent relies on the sound reason language, which provides, quote, modest flexibility. So we're starting from very different views of this panel's, um, how this panel is bound to circuit precedent. And the dissent has a different view of the intervening cases, particularly of the Supreme Court's decision in Gantt. And that was the case uh, where the court holds that officers can't search the passenger compartment of the arrestee's vehicle because there's no possibility that the arrestee could have reached um, into the area. And the dissent says, under Gantt, the question is whether the arrestee had, quote, immediate control over the item that officers want to search without a warrant. And then the dissent goes on to discuss other circuit court decisions applying Gantt's immediate control test outside of vehicles, including situations involving containers and specifically backpacks. So unlike Etherton, which focused on whether the briefcase was of the person, the dissent says we should be looking at whether what police want to search was in the arrestee's immediate control. And the dissent concludes, you know, Perez was secured in handcuffs and under an officer's supervision while another officer searched the backpack on a squad car. And that was a warrantless search that violated the Fourth Amendment. So there's different conclusions on whether there's a Fourth Amendment violation. And then there's one final thing on the, on the dissent, because the dissent also says that there is a, there's a Fourth Amendment violation and that the exclusionary rule um, should apply. And what the dissent, the, the point that the dissent is making here 
is that um, the good faith, uh, the good faith exception, which would mean that the exclusionary rule doesn't apply, um, should not apply here. And so, in essence, the dissent is arguing that officers should err on the side of constitutional conduct in the face of unclear or eroded precedent. So the dissent is looking at cases like Chadwick and Gantt, the more recent Supreme Court decisions, and saying officers were required to follow the logic of those cases and decline to search Perez's backpack, even though there was no case specifically overruling Etherton. And the majority disagrees with this completely. These different views about the good faith exception reflect this underlying view about what we expect from police officers. The dissent's position is that even when circuit precedent would permit a particular search, officers should be aware of when that decision has become unclear or eroded. This is a bit like the dissent's view of circuit precedent, right? When there's a sound reason to believe that circuit precedent has been undermined, courts and law enforcement should be extremely skeptical of relying on that precedent. And I think that highlights two very different views of law enforcement's obligations. One is that law enforcement should, or at least can, exploit gray areas or loopholes until formally told by a court that its behavior is unconstitutional. And the other view is that law enforcement should avoid even potential constitutional violations as a way to respect people's rights. Ultimately, I think the dissent has the better argument here on both the um, Fourth Amendment violation and the application of the good faith exception. Um, I am curious to see whether there would be a petition for a hearing on Bonk. This, as I mentioned before, is um, there's a circuit split on this issue. So it seems like a good um, situation for there to be a rehearing on Bonk, but we'll, we'll see what happens. John, I noticed that the um, the majority the majority and the dissent were pretty respectful and careful toward each other's opinions. I think there's a lot of good faith kind of struggling with where to go from here. The majority seemed to be um, just very, very careful about about doing something different than it had done before and um, expressed concern that they were just one panel in the First Circuit. Um, and because, you know, that the, it wasn't very, very clear that this form of um, personal you know, objects on the person, containers on the person hadn't been explicitly overruled, that they really called for an en banc review of this, wouldn't you say, at the end of their opinion? Um, and perhaps that'll happen. Yeah. I, and I do think the end of the majority's opinion is essentially something like, look, we we clearly disagree about whether um, this this earlier panel decision is clearly overruled, um, Etherton. And that's going to be up to the to the um, the entire First Circuit to decide that it is a more cautious approach um, to deciding this issue. Etherton is clearly on point, and I think that you see this this tension pretty often, especially in areas where you're having a lot of developing law, and you can see this even after Riley. This this question of um, okay, the search incident to arrest exception doesn't apply to cell phones. Um, what else doesn't it apply to? And, and having to reason from, from that decision, and you'll see some courts take a more conservative um, view that they're going to hold that decision essentially to its facts. And I think that you, you have other courts um, who are taking something closer to the dissent's approach here, which is if you look at the logic of those opinions, if you look at the rationale, there's no way to square um, these earlier decisions with the intervening one. I was going to say, um, say it goes up to the Supreme Court, um, this exact case. Given Chadwick, given Gant and Riley, do you think that you know the, the Supreme Court is moving toward more of an immediate control analysis? Are you hopeful that way? I do think that that Chadwick and Gant and Riley and, and honestly many of the other um, I would say last 10 years or so of Fourth Amendment decisions are going back to two things here. One is I think that a lot of the decisions are going back to first principles 
on what exactly was the justification for this exception in the first place. And so I think that you see the Supreme Court reigning in attempts to apply exceptions um, far beyond its original justification. So here that, again, it would be officer safety and the destruction of evidence. Um, and so just, just on that ground, if you look at the justifications, I have a hard time seeing why officers could not have taken the backpack and then obtained a warrant. They would have been able to obtain a warrant pretty easily, most likely. Um, but it would have, have put, um, a neutral and detached magistrate between law enforcement and, and Perez, which, um, I think is good. And one of the goals of the, of the fourth amendment. So on that hand, I think that the court's emphasis on the principles behind these justifications would be good. Um, and then in general, I think that the court has just seen repeated attempts to expand the exception. So I think that there has there's become a, an atmosphere of skepticism for um, for this. And and I do think that the court has been moving towards um, th this view that law enforcement is going to exploit gray areas until the court um, kind of wax each of them down. It, it is something like whack-a-mole, right? The, the court announces a new principle and then um, law enforcement finds way, places where that principle doesn't exactly apply and, and it probably will take the Supreme Court, especially because of the circuit split. I, I was very surprised reading this. I didn't realize there have been that few cases about search incident to arrest at the Supreme Court in these types of scenarios, it seems like there were a lot in the early days of incorporation in the, the late sixties and seventies. And then maybe the court got tired of it until it came, until it came to, to cell phones, but we'll see if this one goes up. One, one thing I uh, thought was interesting after a, the last few shows that we've done um, is the, the, the circuit precedent angle, because um, of course this, this comes up, all the time in the, the circuit courts. And we've talked about it many times on short circuit, but particularly last few shows um, we've been talking about the rule of uh, is it regularity that um, cir circuits follow their own three judge panel precedent until they go on bonk with certain narrow exceptions. But it's like every circuit has its own kind of approach. So we've done, we did the fifth circuit a week or two ago and, you know, they had a couple standard exceptions, one of which is that the Supreme Court has, you know, announced a new rule and it's and it's obvious that it's a new rule. The First Circuit has this kind of hen's teeth rare second way to do it, which which you just explained, John. I like that. Maybe that the metaphor there. Uh, but it's funny that this is this is something that every circuit has. And so there's a circuit split on how circuits have their own precedent, but it's not a circuit split. I think the Supreme court would ever rule on because when it gets to the Supreme court, like who cares, you know, whether you violate what, whether the circuit was, was didn't follow its own precedent or not at that point, it's, it's water under the bridge. So it's probably just never going to be addressed. And it's just always something that all the circuits just kind of do their own thing and, you know, maybe learn from each other on. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And the First Circuit has has the two the two ways to overcome prior precedent. One is this, you know, it's been specifically overruled, and the other is this. I would say it's an implied overruling um, where you look at the logic of the decisions and intervening. Well, and it, but um, it's even like, decisions. and those judges would have ruled the other way if they knew about these new cases, right. which is getting pretty kind of hokey um, in terms of reading minds. It is, especially minds from the seventies. <laughs> it is. And and I think that another reason that you won't see this really um, a, a clear rule be made about this is, as you can see from the majority in the dissent here, there is a pretty broad spectrum uh, of how this rule is articulated. You see the hen's teeth side of the spectrum, and you also see um, a, a more kind of loose uh, interpretation of this. And I have a hard time um, seeing judges... Uh, wanting to tie their hands one way or another on that. Um, so I think that's another reason why we might never sure. end up with a cl clear rule on it. Well, uh, a class of individuals who usually don't have their hands tied other than judges are congressmen. But one particular congressman uh, was uh, ha uh, was handcuffed 
um, for some shenanigans that he uh, was involved with. And uh, Betsy's going to tell us whether his, after his hands were tied, if she, he should have been brought um, to California or not. So um, what's going on with former, we should emphasize, former Congressman Jeffrey Fortenberry? What is going on with him, Anthony? This case is the United States versus Fortenberry. As you know, it comes out of the Ninth Circuit, but um, perhaps any appeals regarding this guy should have come out of the Eighth Circuit or perhaps the D.C. Circuit, as we'll see. Um, it involved an investigation of illegal contributions by a foreign national, which the FBI was conducting back in 2016. And uh, as we know, a federal election law prohibits foreign nationals from contributing to uh, campaigns for uh, federal office, state office, even local office. And that includes either directly or indirectly. Uh, so this investigation was being run by the Los Angeles field office for the FBI. And that is in the Central District of California, which we know is in the Ninth Circuit. And uh, the FBI suspected that an illegal contribution was made to Jeffrey Fortenberry. And that was at a fundraiser in Los Angeles. And they were concerned that um, the foreign national was funneling donor dollars through some straw man donors. Uh, so Jeffrey Fortenberry, he's uh, a he was a longtime member of Congress um, in the House of Representatives. He represented ne Nebraska's first congressional district, and he lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, so after that fundraiser in Los Angeles, um, someone called Fortenberry and told him that that foreign national was probably the source of thirty thousand uh, dollars in campaign donations. And that person who called him happened to be a cooperating witness with the FBI, and there happened to be an FBI agent on that phone call, uh, you know, secretly listening to what uh, Congressman Fortenberry had to say about that. And um, so after that phone call, agents traveled from Los Angeles to Lincoln, Nebraska, to have a chat with him. And at that time, Congressman Fortenberry said that he was not aware of any foreign or conduit donations. After that, he got a lawyer, <laughs> and uh, when he was in uh, Washington, D.C., presumably for his congressional duties, uh, he had another meeting with the FBI in Washington, D.C. with his lawyer present, and at that time, he said again that he was not aware of any foreign or conduit donations. Um, but you'll, you know, you'll recall that the FBI agent was listening in on that phone call, so uh, he was indicted. And but he wasn't indicted for breaking any uh, campaign finance laws. The only thing he was indicted for was making false statements to the FBI those two times. Um, so you, you'll recall that he he made those false statements in Lincoln, Nebraska and in Washington, D.C., not in Los Angeles. But he was indicted in Los Angeles. And that, you know, is the location of the the local um, FBI field office. So you can imagine that this case is about, you know, where to try somebody. We're into venue. We're into the vicinage clause of the Constitution. And that's all about where it's fair to try, in this case, a criminal. Um, so, you know, we conceive of these rules as being procedural. As lawyers, we study them as procedural. But, um, you know, a lot of procedural rules are really about um, our concern for fairness. And um, for criminals, you know, we say that it's not fair for a criminal or, you know, a defendant to be tried in, you know, some distant location where the crime never happened. Um, maybe some reasons for that might be that local juries, you know, just are fair because they maybe are less strangers to the impact of the crime that was committed there. Or maybe they're more familiar with the pressures that the defendant might have been facing um, my civil procedure professor used to talk to used to talk about being homered. So you wouldn't want to be, um, you know, tried somewhere that wasn't your home because it's like a, an away team, right? Being right. playing um, the home court. So it's just a fundamental fairness issue. Um, this is an issue that the American founders were highly aware of, and the Ninth Circuit points to this. And actually, the Supreme Court uh, just in a in a decision last term, they dealt with a a venue um, case where the issue was, you know, somebody had been tried in a in a, a venue where they um, it ended up being like an unfair venue. And so his conviction was overturned. And he said, well, that triggers, you know, that basically means I can't be tried again. You know, it's unfair. It's almost like a double, double jeopardy clause means I can't be tried again. And the Supreme Court said, no, um, you you uh, 
you can be retried just because you were tried in an unfair venue doesn't mean that you can't be retried. So, but in that case that you talked about, you know, that our founders concern about fairness around location of, of, of your trial. And um, they described how prior to the revolution, the British parliament would like circumvent local trials um, before colonial juries by author authorizing trials in England for both British soldiers who had create, you know, committed murder and also for colonists that were, you know, um, charged with uh, or accused of treason. You know, colonists would have to go over to England to be tried um, or, you know, British soldiers could be taken away from the colonies to be tried. And uh, the founders found this to be very unfair. And so we have provisions in the Constitution that provide for a fair location for your trial. And those two clauses are the venue clause and the vicinage clause. So the venue clause is concerned with like the specific geographic location of a particular court. And so that specifically has to do with where something will be tried. And that's in Article 3 of the Constitution. Um, and it mandates that the trial of all crimes shall be held in the state where the crimes have been committed. Then there's the vicinage clause, which is part of the Sixth Amendment. And it's really about juries and about your district. So uh, the Supreme Court explained that vicinage um, is about really about jury composition. And they, they need to be sourced from the state and the district where the crime was committed. So the people who will be judging you are local to where the crime was committed. And the Sixth Amendment guarantees um, the right to an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall be uh, shall have been committed. So these these clauses work together to um, you know bring enforce fairness as best we can for the accused, especially criminal um, defendants. Okay, so back to Fortenberry. So he moved, he was indicted in Los Angeles. And he moved to dismiss the case for improper venue, um, and that was denied. So um, he was he was saying that his that false statements if made would have been made in Lincoln, Nebraska, and Washington D.C., not Los Angeles. Uh, but you know that move motion was denied, and a, a Los Angeles jury found a Nebraskan congressman guilty. Right of lying um, in Nebraska. Of lying in Nebraska. So I, I think it's a pretty, I mean, if I were him, I'd be like, I got homered too, right? Like I'm, a, who who knows me in Los Angeles? Um, it's it's an unfair venue for him, uh, is what he said. So so his, his sentence, you know, the jury found him guilty. His sentence was two years of probation, 320 hours of community service and a $25,000 fine. And he resigned from Congress, right? So he didn't go to jail, but he had some consequences. Um, so the question was, was Fortenberry right that the Los Angeles venue was just unfair and wrong? And ultimately, the Ninth Circuit does say, yeah, that was unfair and wrong. And um, but you, how they got there is, you know, they described how we have to how, how we have to determine venue in these kinds of situations. And generally speaking, uh, the Supreme Court has said that venue is proper at the loc locus delicti. And the, lo the locus delicti is uh, determined from first the nature of the crime alleged and then the location of the acts or acts constituting that crime. And so, and then to determine the nature of the crime alleged, you have to look at the essential conduct of the elements of the offense. So for Fortenberry, he was indicted under 18 USC section 1001 about false statements. And that provides that whoever in any manner within the jurisdiction of the executive, legislative, or judicial branch of the government of the United States knowingly and willfully falsifies, conceals, or covers up any trick, scheme, or device, or material fact, or two, makes any materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or representation is guilty of this crime, guilty of a false statement. So the elements there then um, would be he had to make a statement that was false and material with specific intent in a matter with the agencies within the agency's jurisdiction. So those are the elements. And the Ninth, the Ninth Circuit says that um, to discover the nature of the offense, we have to understand what the essential conduct of the offense was. So we need to look at those five elements and see which was which element is the essential conduct of that offense, right? Everything else is just circumstantial. And 
yeah, you need them to, you need those elements to convict, but it's not a factor in deciding where venue should be. Um, so to give you an illustration, and this is um, a crime that the court used as an illustration is, is the, um, to, to be able to discover what element is an essential, um, is essential conduct for venue purposes versus circumstantial elements. They talked about money laundering and I'll give you an example of my hometown in California. There was a restaurant there, it was a sports bar, and it was a pretty busy um, commercial district where it was in, and I was there almost daily, maybe multiple times a day driving through there. And there was a sports bar that never had anybody in there. And well, I, I thought you meant you were in the bar multiple times daily, but okay. No, 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 th- no, just driving by, just driving by. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, no, I wasn't in there and nobody else was either. That place was chronically empty and I couldn't believe that it it stayed open. Um, and then it would and then it would like go through a rehab and then it would be open under the same management, but like a different a different, um, I don't know, theme. And they just never had any customers. And I didn't I didn't understand how they could, uh, you know, stay in business. And it occurred to me one day that maybe maybe there might be something else going on. <laughs> and so, so let's, let's imagine a sports bar that, um, you know, was actually the owners were actually funding their life and their operations by drug money from San, San Antonio, New Mexico. Okay. And so they're, they're laundering money through this sports bar, um, with money from New Mexico and they're in orange California. Uh, so the, the money laundering elements are an actual or attempted financial transaction involving the proceeds of specified unlawful activity as with knowledge that the transaction involves the proceeds um, from that unlawful activity and with either intent to promote um, that unlawful activity or knowledge that the transaction is designed to promote that unlawful activity. So you have a bunch of elements here, but there are only really two elements involving conduct, right? So those are one and two, an actual or attempted financial transaction involving proceeds from specific unlawful activity. Um, But the statute about money laundering is only concerned about about the money laundering. It's not concerned about the the actions that might have, you know, earned that drug money. And so the venue... The, the element that is relevant to venue would be just the element where the money laundering took place. So it didn't matter what happened in New Mexico. You wouldn't go try this person in New Mexico. You would try that person in Orange, California, where the money laundering was happening, right? So even though there's conduct, it's not the essential conduct for purposes of venue. So in Fort and Berry's case, you have something kind of similar. So you have a, the essential conduct with the court described it as plainly being he was making a false statement. That was the essential conduct for venue purposes that we need to be focusing on. If to, just as a reminder, the elements for the false statement were he had to make a false statement that was false and material with specific intent in a matter with the agency's jurisdiction. So the only conduct element there is making a statement that was false. Um, the district court in the Ninth Circuit said, that this materially, materiality element is also an essential conduct element. So again, he had to make a statement that was false and material. So the district court accepted the FBI's argument that materiality necessarily depends on, it's, it, is, it is a conduct element because it necessarily depends on how a listener would perceive the utterance wherever the listener might be located. So the venue could be any district in which the effects of the false statement were felt um, under this logic. And the government argued that there was nothing weird about prosecuting a false statement in the location of the government action that the statement could potentially influence. Like they could be feeling the, you know, FBI could be feeling the effects of the material, materially false statement. And therefore that's translates to conduct of some sort. Um, And you guys can imagine that what that would mean is that like wherever the FBI is, you know, hearing this false statement um, is an effect to the FBI and potentially influencing to the FBI. And so wherever the FBI is, venue there is too, right? Um, that's the, the logical outcome Which of this. Which could be and, any state. I mean, there's no limit on it. Oh, it could be any yeah. state. As the 
as the court does um, go on to to inquire about. And I'll, I'll read you some of their questions. It was, it was good. So they just said, no, no, no. They just rejected that argument and said that materiality is not conduct because it doesn't require anything to actually happen. Um, so the, the distinction here, and I think the, um, what this ultimately comes down to and, and what is now the subject of a circuit split is, is conduct over effects, right? So um, we're concerned in the venue and vicinage clauses are concerned with conduct and not with effects. And so like not like the kind of effects that the conduct might have. Um, so the Supreme Court has said that, um, I'm sorry, the Ninth Circuit recognizes the Supreme Court really hasn't um, addressed the broader question of whether and when the, an effects-based venue um, might be permissible. Uh, there's a circuit split about it. So the second, fourth, and seventh allow effects-based venue decisions and then and then the 10th 11th and now the 9th um look at conduct for for venue so i don't know john's case might might go up you know and resolve a circuit split and mine too and you'll have to have us back <laughs> together um anyway the ninth circuit ultimately decides that the act of uttering a false statement is the conduct that is essential to liability here and there were no statements that were uttered in Los Angeles. They were uttered in Nebraska. They were uttered in, Los, in Washington, D.C., but not Los Angeles. Um, so going back to what you were saying, Anthony, about, about it could be anywhere, you know, the, I, I'm just going to read you the, the questions that the Ninth Circuit posed because they're great. Um, they said, what if the investigation had been conducted by federal agents in Los Angeles and Oklahoma? What if the government had transferred the investigation to agents in Massachusetts? What if an investigating agent simply moved from Los Angeles to Hawaii for personal reasons, but maintained a lead role in prosecuting the case? What if the government chose to base every single Section 100, uh, 1001 investigation in Washington, D.C., where federal agencies are headquarters? And they just said that result just can't be squared with the Constitution. Venue and vicinage clauses may not be disregarded simply because it suits the convenience of federal prosecutors. It's a good outcome. Um, there were some other theories that the government uh, introduced, um, and we can talk about those if you want. But um, but I will say that one of them was that they said that like there are statutes that provide for venues that span different, like some offenses can span, span venues, um, excuse me. Some offenses can um, be prosecuted in multiple venues. So for instance, um, the, the court gave an example that um, the Supreme Court gave long ago saying that you can you can shoot a gun in one jurisdiction and it can hit somebody, you know, the bullet can hit somebody in another jurisdiction, either jurisdiction will work for that. And the federal uh, statute for murder or manslaughter um, explicitly provides that venue, I'll, I'll just say it says, in all cases of murder or manslaughter, the offense shall be deemed to have been committed at the place where the injury was inflicted or the poison administered or other means employed, which caused the death without regard to the place where the death occurs. That's an example of, you know, Congress setting venue for certain crimes. They didn't do that in, in the false statement statute. And they also didn't include any, like, effects um, element in that statute. So we're left with conduct, according to the Ninth Circuit, which is just about f making of the false statement. And we're left with no direction from Congress about what their thoughts on where it might be tried. And so in the absence of that, um, it, we're, we're left with where the conduct took place, and that was not Los Angeles. Um, I will um, point to this whole issue of Congress setting the venue uh, within the statute, um, I I had read something by a guy named Anthony Sanders uh, from a couple what? of month a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, uh, talking about talking about this question about you know um, about when a law making body um, dictates venue within within a, a crime like a, a criminal statute. And in that case, you were talking about an Illinois statute regarding cyber right, crime. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yeah. And and they they dictated um, il the Illinois uh, legislature dictated that 
um, venue was proper where the either the offense occurred, the information used to commit the offense was illegally used, or the victim resides, which you can imagine is across the country, right? Um, and your point there was that, you know, statute criminal statutes are still statute and they can't trump the constitution. And um, I was trying to imagine, you know, like at what point it becomes so unfair that it violates one of these um, constitutional provisions. And I, I'm not sure. And I think if I remember there, it was, uh, we can put a link up to it as a blog post I did a couple years ago that that was about the Illinois constitution, which requires trial in the, I think the County where the crime is right. committed. Right. And, and did the, did the, the court basically said that it, it was just too loosey goosey how that statute was. Yeah. Doing? The court was just like, it's not, you know, it's not up to us to defer yeah. or to, um, sorry, it's not up to us to question their choices. Um, so they but, were so they were okay yeah. with yes uh, they, the legislature they affirmed wrote. it yeah right. mm -hmm. I was um I was kind of curious during the court's discussion of the effects element because on one hand it seems like the court is not necessarily skeptical of effects um, effects elements that there might that there are certain crimes that um, you could constitutionally um, define in a way where venue would be appropriate. Um, wherever the effects were felt. At the same time, I think that the court did mention that that's a, a, an open question um, that the court hasn't really dug into. Is that right? Or was it only like some feature of the effects? Element? Yeah, I think that, I think that, well, there are definitely crimes that have effect or kind of like influence as an element. And, um, and the Ninth Circuit here did deal with those. Uh, some examples are, um, like the, a false statement influencing federal insurance institution. Um, but it actually says anyone who knowingly makes any false statement for the purpose of influencing. Um, and in this case, you know, the, the false statement at issue in Fortenberry's case had nothing like that. It basically opened up like, like you, you could be guilty of making a false statement, whether it actually influenced the FBI or not. And so because it wasn't actually something you had to show, um, influence wasn't something you had to show in order to convict, then, then you know, you can't just import effects um, when it's not there. They, they also, some of, the, um, some of the circuits that have dealt with this and, and the government here argued that you basically can think of it like um, the Hobbs Act, which which, you know, if you violate the Hobbs Act, your you're one element is you are affecting commerce. And the government was just like, well, you can, you can, you know, it's not like this is weird to think about effects. I mean, look at the Hobbs Act. But the court pointed out that, well, one of the elements of a Hobbs Act violation is you actually have to affect something. <laughs> so, um, and the same with obstruction, obstruction of justice, right? And one, one element is to influence or obstruct or impede or some, some impede, somehow affect somebody's action. Um, but that's not, that's not what you have here. So I think, I think the Ninth Circuit got it right. Um, we'll see. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about the, the effects part of this because some of the practical concerns that the court highlights um, about allowing the alternative outcome here, like it, all the ones that you listed before, many of those seem to be present if in an, in any crime that has an effects element. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't seem like the practical issues are necessarily um, what's driving this. I mean, it, it seems to be it seems to me at least that what's driving this is something like does the defendant the statute needs to needs to have an effects element if you want to if you want to pick venue that way but also maybe is the offense defined in a way that a, a defendant would know that they could um be sued in those in those venues mm -hmm. because if they look at the statute not that any defendant is looking at the statute and saying oh i wonder where my venue will be if i when i get right. caught eventually <laughs> um but it, it does seem to be that that's some of the fairness the the logic that's that's going on here is you know if you looked at the statute as a defendant um like would you know that this offense could lead you committing this offense could lead you to being brought into particular venues or or could could the government orchestrate the venue 
which is, mm-hmm. which of course right. the Ninth Circuit pointed out it it, it absolutely can't hear. Um, I, I think this case is yet another reminder. Um, there have been quite a few the last few years uh, to all Americans um, to never talk to the FBI. Uh, that's basically the, uh, the bottom <laughs> line. And the uh, the, the, the congressman um, was uh, was not cognizant of that. Well, Betsy, thanks so much for that explanation of a uh, of venue and vicinage clause, which uh, is one of my flav- favorite little clauses of the Constitution. Never been incorporated against the states, by the way, in the in the Bill of Rights, one of the, the very few. Uh, but we won't go down that rabbit hole right now. And John, thank you for your uh, story of the backpack. We'll see if that backpack goes any higher where they don't have a certain kind of font that it won't have to deal with anymore. Um, I am going to go back <laughs> to my throat lozenges and hopefully sound better next week. But in the meantime, I want all of you to get engaged. Mm-hmm.